to um, our study together, our last study of the year, um, and then we'll move to a Christmas, I would say Christmas series of sermons, um, and I'm yet to kind of understand, decide what that is, as it were. Um, many ways to do this. I don't want to necessarily just repeat it for the sake of Christmas, most certainly, but um, uh, I'll let you know uh, next week what that will be. So, but today we're looking at the ascension, the last significant event of uh, Jesus' presence on earth after he was resurrected. Uh, and the ascension is the ultimate purpose and encouragement for those who believe in Jesus. <clears throat> it tells us that if we run the race of this life now with the knowledge that Christ has ascended to the throne, we will arrive in that same place he now sits and rules. Uh, let me be clear, we don't sit on his throne, okay? But we, we are in the same place, in the place that he rules uh, and is right now. We will enjoy the fruits of the work of Christ and his rule on the throne now as we live our life as Christians, uh, not only in part here, but in fullness when we see him face to face. Um, so where does the ascension fit in with the important life of the person of Christ uh, and what does it mean for us? Because after all, that is the question that we're looking at today. And so where do we find ourselves? What's the, what's the, the actual place of where we are uh, when we come to the ascension itself? We find ourselves 40 days uh, after the resurrection. Jesus leads his disciples to Bethany outside Jerusalem. He lifts his hands uh, and then he blesses them. And he says this in Luke 24, 50 to 51, when he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. And this is an interesting moment uh, that the disciples experienced, especially after the initial response to the ascension itself. Many times the disciples um, themselves experienced Jesus simply disappearing from certain events. Uh, simply removing himself from situations. Um, but the disappearances of Jesus uh, did not have a particular sparkle about it. It didn't have a particular event about it. What we, When we read it, it, it does seem almost strange that Jesus in one time can uh, walk through a crowd, as we find here in Luke 4, 28 to 30, where the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of town took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down a cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Nothing spectacular about it, only the fact that he was able to walk through without anyone actually noticing that he walked through and was able to carry on and get out of that situation. After all, he is also God. Uh, John 5 verse 13 uh, says, The man who was uh, healed had no idea who it was for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. So this disappearance at the ascension had to be more than Jesus uh, just being there in one moment and then the next moment not being there, effectively disappearing into the crowd. It couldn't happen that way. So we find this event in Acts 1, verse 9 to 11, and it said, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and the cloud hid them uh, from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white in white stood beside them men of galilee they said why do you stand here looking into the sky this same jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven so it was important that jesus showed them that this would be the last appearance he would make at least for his first coming. It would be the last time they would actually see him. Uh, and we find the text tells us that rather than Jesus disappearing behind a cloud, uh, as, as the same way he might have disappeared into a crowd and out of a crowd, uh, the cloud actually hid him from their sight. So again, it's to emphasize that he didn't disappear. Uh, it's to say that God hid him away from their sight. Uh, and the cloud itself is is no normal cloud, of course. This cloud is the cloud of God's glory. But it's often associated with the presence of God in the Old and New Testament. So uh, there is a physicalness about what is happening right now in front of their eyes. It's the cloud, not just any cloud that happened to pass by. It is God's cloud, and it's Jesus behind that cloud 
uh, who is then ascending to heaven. But in any case, it was important that God made this event an amazing spectacle for the disciples. And it's interesting why the angels asked the disciples, why do you stand here looking into the sky? And I can, I can think of two reasons why this has been asked. I think the fact they mentioned that they're looking into the sky and not at Jesus serves the disciples in confirming that they now are simply looking at the sky. They're looking at an empty sky, not looking at Jesus anymore, uh, because he has now gone to heaven. Not Jesus, not God, not heaven, but the sky. And, and the second reason I think it is, is because they need to be reminded of what Jesus said to them earlier was still the case even though he'd risen. We know that even though Jesus had told the disciples many times about his going to the cross and the reason for it, the disciples wanted to believe something else about what he was doing. They wanted to believe that he was coming to take to overthrow Rome and to remove these rulers. And even when he told them, uh, they still didn't understand. It's only very much towards the end that they, he tells them, finally you understand, finally you get it. But in Acts 1, uh, previously, previous verses here in Acts 1, on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, uh, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father was sent by his own authority, but you will receive your power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It, is not. it should be 11, but it only goes to 8. That's fine. No, that is correct. Let me carry on. Okay. In any case, we look at this, and I wonder if actually there was still this, uh, as they look up into the sky, I wonder if there was this kind of hope still within them that they thought, maybe this is it. Maybe Jesus didn't really mean that. Maybe Jesus didn't really mean that the kingdom might be restored yet. So let's, let's watch and see what happens. And so I wonder, looking into the sky, they still have this sort of vain hope that maybe something's going to happen. You know, the sky's going to change colour and everything's going to, the clouds are going to come in and Jesus is riding back on his horse and all this good stuff. Uh, and yet, all they're doing is actually looking up into the sky. Um, but the purpose for the disciples was that they saw Jesus actually went somewhere. Uh, it's not that he just disappeared. Now they actually saw him go somewhere. He went to a place. He went to heaven. And we, we might understand that maybe the, what the cloud did was hid, uh, Jesus, hid, hid heaven from the sight of the disciples who were standing watching. So maybe there's a sense that there's a practical need for the cloud in order that Jesus actually enters heaven, uh, but actually they can't see it because uh, Jesus says, it's not coming yet, it's not time, it's not going to happen. So we must remember that Jesus didn't disappear into an ethereal, into a ghostly place uh, and himself becoming a, in spirit-like appearance. Uh, we learned last week that that was the case. Jesus bodily, we still had the same body he ascended with. Uh, he will come back exactly the same in that same body. We will see him in heaven in that same body. He will not be a spirit. He will not be a ghost. He will be a physical being, uh, but will be, as always has been, God. Um, so it won't be in that spiritual appearance as well, spirit-like appearance. Jesus ascended to this real physical place of heaven and so remains in this bodily form as he left this place. But how that place exists as a real place, uh, as we're able to see real things around us, is not strictly important. But it does exist. It may well be that in as much as we are unable to see the spiritual world that exists around us now, we also do not have this capacity to see the place of heaven right now. And so we know that the battle uh, is in the spiritual realm. We know that that is happening around us right now. Uh, but we can't see it. We don't see the spiritual realm in that way. And so in the same way, maybe that's why we don't see the physical place of heaven. God has not allowed us to see that place. Hence why when they look up into the sky, they only see the sky. Uh, now, is heaven above the clouds? Is it literally 
uh, above the earth. Let's not get into that because that's not how it works. It's not that heaven is sitting above. Otherwise, we would have telescopes telling us here's, here's heaven sitting above planet earth. It doesn't work like that. Um, but it is good to know that this is a, a, a proper physical place. Maybe we just don't have the eyes or actually God doesn't allow us to see it. But there are only a few occasions where someone else had a glimpse of heaven while on earth. Stephen was one when he was dying. Uh, he said this, Acts 7, 55 to 56. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven, saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Uh, look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So we do know it is a real place because he's allowed to see it. We know, we know that John saw this place as well as it is revealed to him through Revelation also. So this place is real. This place does exist. And it could be, of course, another reason why the disciples were so intently staring into the sky, maybe to catch this glimpse of heaven. Maybe they wanted to see what heaven looked like as Jesus went into it. Almost like just as the door closed, they just want to catch a glimpse and just see Jesus disappear into heaven uh, as well. Uh, but what is important about Jesus' ascension was, that, was what happened after he had sent, ascended. Jesus, as both God and man, would now receive glory, honour and authority. Before Jesus died, he prayed this to the Father. He said this, John 17, verse 1 to 5. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began just in case you don't realise Jesus was at the beginning uh, of what we would know as the beginning and always there beforehand, uh, this verse of Jesus' own mouth, own words, says, I was there before the foundation of the world, before the world began. So what Jesus is asking is, I'm always God, he's always been God and always will remain God. Now what he's saying is, now I'm gonna, I've done the work to glorify you and now you're going to glorify me because I'm going to, have, I'm going to be with you on the throne again. I'm going to be with the Trinity, as it were, although technically never left the Trinity, but I'm going to be with you and now honour me and glorify me as I honour and glorify you. As Jesus the Son glorifies God the Father in his death on the cross for all sin for all time, so conversely it has to be so that God the Son is glorified by God the Father in the resurrection and the ascension. It is the way it is because it is God. It's simply not just because Jesus is the person of Jesus, but also because he is God. So glory has to, be, has to go backwards and forwards because he is one God, three persons. What this helps us with is understand a little bit more of the triune God that they are still one, he's still one God and three persons. Glory has to be constant, never-ending between the three. One God, three persons. Glory to glory to glory. Uh, I was at this, at this conference, as I said, on Thursday, and twice during some speeches, uh, they, two people said uh, it would not be a Baptist conference without a quote from Spurgeon. Uh, and I was so, so encouraged by that, uh, that we had two Spurgeon quotes uh, during the conference, which kept me going for a whole day uh, as they was reading them out. But so I thought I'd throw one in. Spurgeon, uh, when you ask a blessing from God, ask that you may glorify God by it. Do you pine to have your health back again? Be sure that you want to spend it for him. Do you desire temporal advancement? Desire that you prom may promote his glory. Do you even long for growth in grace? Ask it only that you may glorify him. In essence, what he's saying is whatever you ask for, it is actually not for you, but it is to the glory of God. If you want advancement, which is also fine, if you want your career to advance, that's fine, but to the glory of God may it be. 
If I'm not asking for that into the glory of God, then I would say God would not give it to me. Because what I'm asking for is for my glory. I'm asking for me to be glorified. I'm asking for myself to be made known to people. Happens in churches, happens with pastors who become celebrities. Unfortunately, what it becomes about is the person and not the glory to God. What it becomes more about is the person standing at the front and not the glory to the one who made it possible in the first place. What is fundamental to Jesus receiving his authority as he had before is that because he is the son of God who came to save sinners from eternal hell by dying on the cross, he has the authority to give that eternal life to mankind this is his purpose this is his work which has been given to do he now completes it but as his authority is and his purpose was so he can give it to mankind and say my authority i can give to you but it's only for those that have been given to him that is to say it's those who trust and believe that jesus is lord who put their faith in the everlasting lord who's not only conquered death, but now sits on the right hand of the Father. And I think I only have two quotes, but this is from someone else. It's not Spurgeon uh, Morris. He says, in this world, we are familiar with the truth that it is a blessing and an inspiration to know certain people. Much more is it the case when we know God. Uh, it's great to have relationships and friendships and get to know people. Uh, but the, the most important relationship is with God. We know this because, first of all, we should worship and love Lord our God Almighty as a first rule, the first law. Second is to love your neighbour as yourself, as you want them to come to Jesus. But always to love God first. The best person to know, if you know nobody, is to know God. The best person to know, if you're a hermit, if you don't know, don't go out anywhere, if you sit in your home doing nothing at all, if you don't go out and, and even call anybody, the best person to know is God. Even so, we, we know a day is coming when every single person will know who Jesus is. And sadly, it will not be for the reason of faith for many, but rather some will know who Jesus is even in their unbelief. Philippians 2, 9 to 11 says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do you see it has continued? There's no, there's no contradiction. Even in Philippians we find, so what Jesus said about himself and the Father, we find in Philippians. There's a continuation of this theme. It's unrelenting, the glory to glory. Glory to the Father, who's the Father who gives glory to Jesus. But let it be known, as it says in this verse, every person will know Jesus Christ regardless of whether you're a believer or not, regardless of whether you put your trust in him or not. And I say this, I have to make this clear, this is not universalism. It is not because Jesus will come back and suddenly go, well, because you know me now, you're going to come with me. It is simply a case that, as it says in these verses, people under the earth will know him. That is in hell. People will know Jesus despite their place, despite where they'll end up. They will know him. And Philippians is clear on this. So it's been declared that Jesus has all authority. Believing in the risen, ascended Lord of the universe is not some backstop. It's not some emergency break glass in the event of our coming demise. It is an active, real fact that cannot be undone by man's act of simply not believing it to be true. And I think that's where the fear comes from. I think ultimately anyone who asks the question, why is there evil in the world? I think they know. I think they know why they ask that question. And I know, I think, why they ask that question. It's because they know the answer. We are evil people. We are people who deserve wrath. We are people that deserve to face the justice of God. But God makes a way through Jesus Christ who has all authority to give that salvation to mankind and say, if you follow me, you do not have to suffer that wrath. You'll be protected by what I have done in the work on the cross. 
to simply not an emergency Paul called is to simply believe that Jesus is Lord. Ephesians 1 verse 18 to 23 says, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet, appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fulfills everything in every way. Because Jesus Christ united us to himself through his work of redemption on the cross, it means for those that believe in the risen and ascended Jesus, we too are guaranteed a future ascension into heaven. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16-17 For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. We need not shortcut this process of missing out on the life we have now. We have the knowledge and assurance that when we get to heaven, to put it simply, we'll be on Jesus' guest list. When we come to see him, he will look at his list and we will be on it. And what's the list? It's the Lamb, the book of the Lamb, isn't it? And what is that? Is that because we did well in this life? Is it because we did all the right things to look holy? To look holy? To look reverent? No. It is that in your heart, you believe that Jesus is Lord. And that out of that belief, the passionate, genuine belief that that is true, so you will be reverent and holy. Because Jesus Christ is the one that makes us holy. Not because you are able to be holy. This gets mind-bending, doesn't it? Jesus calls us to be holy, and yet we cannot be holy. But the reason, and the good reason for that, is because he wants us to believe in him who is holy. And only able to be holy. So now my assurance is that Jesus has accomplished the task that was put to him. That he did willingly as the Father commanded him to do. And now I have assurance that when I get to heaven, because I still trust and believe in Jesus Christ, my name will be on that list. Our life now is not simply us waiting our turn to enter into eternity. It must be a life lived that seeks to honour and glorify Jesus. But it is a, 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 ch a chance we've been given, a choice to be made, to serve the King who sits on the throne. And so we should be encouraged and full of thankfulness of this life we live now for him and to his glory. Hebrews 12 verse 1 to 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race that has been marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author, perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Have you ever tried to run whilst looking up? Difficult, isn't it? Ever tried to do that? You ever tried to run whilst looking somewhere else? Doesn't work, does it? Uh, oddly, though, we can walk. I've noticed I can walk without looking... Uh, w without necessarily looking forward all the time, but have you noticed running the race is, is very difficult, isn't it? Um, 
here's what I think about that, because I often have these moments of thoughts, and I think, how can someone practically do that? How can I run the race of life but look up to Jesus as I'm running? Clearly, it is not meant as an actual thing you do. You don't actually look up as you run the race of life, but here it is. It is not that we disregard what goes on in our life. It is not that we're just trying to get through in order that we get to heaven. It is that this life is blessed, especially so as that we've now embraced Jesus as our Lord and Saviour. And so if you know the difficulty of this life, how much more will the life be when we get to heaven and be with him forever? That is why the Bible never uh, dresses up this life. It never says your life is suddenly going to become luxurious and comfortable. You are going to be in trouble. You are going to struggle because always what is at the core of who we are is a contention between the draw of sin and the draw of God. But in order to appreciate that place where there is no more sin, we must know what this life is about to know for sure in fullness when we get there that we'll truly know what Jesus did for us on the cross when we arrive. Because our lives will be new. No longer will we be, have to tangle with sin anymore. No longer running the race, fighting off all the other things. Now we've finished our race. But appreciate the finish line because, wow, what a marathon we just ran. What a life we just struggled with but all to the glory of God that may many more see that life that was full of troubles and hassles and difficulties, that many more may see that I stayed with him till the end, not because I was any good, but because Jesus is Lord. And we hope that they may come, not because we ran it well even, but because they're encouraged that, wow, even in the face of adversity, those people that stay with God to the end. I want that. Because I want to see what's at the end as well. I want to have what Jesus promised. So do not discount this life because even in our struggles, it is to reflect the glory of God, uh, let alone the fact that we see this in Jesus Christ on the cross. His death is to reflect the glory of God. That he sent his son to die on the cross when he didn't have to. Whatever mission God has set for every believer to live out here first, we can be assured that Jesus' ascension into heaven gives us assurance that our final home, our home of homes, will be with him in heaven. Jesus persevered through the greatest of suffering, not just physically, but through separation from the Father. Having that in mind may help us to persevere, but not on our own, not in our own strength, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, of whom he sent to us to be our teacher and power. John 14, verse 2 to 3, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Not in some ethereal place, not in some imaginary land, to be where Jesus actually is. Uh, we had uh, a last message on our meeting on Thursday and he spoke about Revelation and he spoke about the time when they sing, holy, 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 uh, is the Lord God Almighty. And he says they were just repeating it over and over again. Holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty. Not some spirit, the Lord Jesus who physically sits on the throne in the physical heaven. Singing it to him so we're all reminded of who Jesus is. That's actually going to happen. That's actually what we'll be doing. And then, of course, couple that with the fact we'll have been a city that is perfect and without sin. 
I don't know the details of how that will work, by the way. I don't know that there'll be skyscrapers and there'll be roads and there'll be cars. I don't know any of that. No one does. We are assured, though, that there is a city. And that is not imagery. That is true. The new city, the new Jerusalem, you will have a new body. One that is no longer affected by sin. And so the city that we'll live in will be no longer affected by sin. For those that endure to the end and understand that to be a crucial part of faith, we can follow Jesus to that place where he is and live with him forever. And it is, of course, only because Jesus has gone, has gone ahead of us to prepare that place that we even have a place at all. So as we look to that place called heaven, we, we use it and should use it for our encouragement continuously today. But let me be clear, Christ has not simply left us to fend for ourselves with some sprinkling of helpful sayings. Wasn't he a nice moral guy? What is given us in his ascension and authority is the ability to stand our ground in this life in preparation for the one to come. Ephesians 6, verse 12 to 13, for our struggle, not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. The day is coming indeed. But then, of course, not only do we have protection, we have weapons. Weapons that will overcome the strongholds of evil. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 1 to 4. By the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you, I, Paul, who am timid, um, but when face to face with you, but bold when away, I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. For though we live in this world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. When we look at these verses, so often these verses are abused and misused. So often they are turned into physical actions uh, that Christians should do, that we should physically attempt to overthrow governments or to uh, protest to the, to the degree that we become violent and claim it to be in Christ's name. But these are not for the purpose of overcoming these things. It's not for the purpose of overcoming a bad boss at work or what is referred to as overcoming the Goliath in your life. It is not those things. Instead, it's about the forces that are actively scheming against our faith and want us to reject God. If you've been told that faith in Jesus is for the purpose of being the best you now and to live your best life today, let me tell you that those are distractions so that the devil can attack you from the other direction. It is mere sleight of hand to tell you that you can live your best life today. If you just believe more, if you just give more money, you can live your best life today. And as you're doing that and focusing on wealth and making yourself look good and big, here comes the dagger that comes at the side from the devil and he gets you. Because now he's got you and he wants you to focus on those things, on those things of earth, on those things of treasures that will be eaten by moths and will not last. And he gets you. The battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the powers of this dark world and the spiritual forces of evil. Revelations 2, 26 to 29, to him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my father, I will also give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
Revelation 3, 21. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. We have this amazing protection and these amazing weapons to remain steadfast in the Lord now. I'm going to tell you what that weapon is, and I'm going to tell you what that protection is. It's the Bible. We were asked a question uh, in an earlier survey. Uh, I, I don't mind this going out because I'm just tired of this subject uh, about same-sex marriage. And the one question that I found that people uh, had was intensely annoyed about was this question. Other than the Bible, I mean, already, other than the Bible, what are you talking about other than the Bible? Other than the Bible, what other resources have you used or seen that will help you understand this issue? There's no other resources. There's just the Bible. Let me tell you, that statement is disturbing beyond belief. The fact that Christians wrote this statement other than the Bible is reveals the core of what is going on. It reveals the core of people who say, yeah, but we don't like what that says. Did you find something that we all might like to read? It is disturbing beyond belief that we would even consider any other resource to be truth. The question itself should not even exist. As Christians, and especially as Baptists, we are known for our dedication to the word. It is the only thing that matters in this life as a Christian. Nothing else matters. No book written by a famous Christian. No book written by a famous pastor. It doesn't matter. Do you know where they got the information from? The Bible. Nothing new under the sun. And yet, what do we do with that information? We take it from the Bible and we twist it and we turn it. Because I don't like what it says about me. I don't like what it reveals about my heart. So I'm going to change it to make it sound a bit nicer. I'm going to change it to make it sound a bit, a bit nicer for me. Let it be known, we are in a spiritual battle for the lives of people. We are in a battle that is saying, reject Jesus, create your own. Christ's ascension to the throne is the promise for us that we will share in Christ's victory and authority over death. It says in these verses that we'll be in authority with him. It's hard to tell what that actually means and what that looks like. It's hard to tell what, uh, certainly Revelation speaks of a specific time that we'll have a, uh, some authority from Jesus to make these decisions over the world. But let me be clear, what this isn't about is superseding Jesus' authority. It is not that you get the same authority as Jesus. It is that you share in the authority of Jesus because he said so and for the time that he allows that for. So this promise of victory and authority over death is sufficient to give us the assurance and perseverance we need to run the race of this life. But, church, we must keep pressing into him. I fear that this is only going to get worse as Christians and more Christians fall away from the word, that we will have to stand our ground as the time comes, not in violence, not because the Bible says don't do this and don't do that, but simply because I believe what the word says and I want you to believe what the word says and I love you so much that I want to share this with you and so that you may come to Jesus Christ who is written in the word. It is not our job to convince people to the point that we will go to violence. 
Our job is to be loving towards those who are unbelieving, who leave the faith and encourage them to come back or to come to Jesus. But there is a point, and the Bible is clear, that when this becomes an argument, you walk away. We're not here to fight these battles on the sense of a physical fight. We're here to trust that Jesus Christ knows what he's doing. And sharing the word will either put people against us or help them come to Jesus. So the promise that will be fulfilled is not only being fulfilled now, but in the age to come will be fully and spectacularly fulfilled when we're reunited with our Lord and Saviour once again and for all time. This is the promise of the Lord. Let's pray and then we'll worship together.